I will be reading to you from Jude. Some people say Jude chapter 1. Some people just say Jude 17 to 26. Let us, our 25 is what it is. I will begin reading at verse 17. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy, mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. If you are a lover of church history, there's one thing that you understand very, very clearly, is that the church must constantly contend for the faith. And when we say church, we're not saying, well, that's the pastor's job, and that's the elder's job, or that's the synod's job, or the class's jobs, or the professor's job. We are speaking about the church, and I'm assuming that each of you is church. Jude is written to believers, and he's saying to every believer, you must be a contender for the faith. And for that to be possible, you and I as individual Christians, living stones on whom Christ builds his church, number one, you better have been taught, thoroughly taught, the word of God. It is a lack of knowledge that the people fall away. Not only should you have been taught, you yourself remain a student of the Word. That's why this, the council decided a year ago, we're going to make available to you table talk. I don't know whether you're reading it. I find it hard because the print is so small, but I find it so interesting, I can't quit. You know what Junior told me last, uh, yeah, this last week? Junior says, Al, I've got that whole November table talk red. I just, wow, I said, you're ahead of me. He says, I find it so interesting so full of the knowledge of God. Not only must it be studied, it must be discussed together. It must be listened to. Because the function of the communion of saints is that we have a wonderful time together. But your and my responsibility to God for each other is that we build each other up, that we strengthen each other, that we encourage each other not to find the lowest common denominator. 
What's the minimal I can study? What's the minimal I should attend? What's the minimal that I should be doing? It should be to encourage each other to accept. Every one of us is responsible to God. We have been given much. And that's what Jude, who by the way, if you haven't heard the other three sermons on this one, I guess two, this is number three, there's number four next week, the Lord willing. Jude is a brother of Jesus, his name is Judas. And he just calls him Jude. Now look at verse 17. I'm just going to preach on three verses this morning. But dear brother, dear friends, he says, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. Jude now, all last week, giving warning after warning, description after description. He's giving example after example of people who have fallen away. But, he says, I'm not going to focus on them. I'm focusing on you. And he calls them my dear friends. I'll call that to all of you as well. Because he is saying, we are one together. We have a common faith. We have a common Lord. We have a common baptism. We are one. And he says, we together must build each other up. So he draws the readers to himself and he strengthens them and he encourages them and he inspires them and he says, remember. The false teachers in the church are no surprise to God. Jesus says in Matthew 24, there will be false teachers and they are in the church to deceive many. They will deceive many. And Jesus goes on and he says, there must happen. There must be false teachers in the church. Why? False teachers divide a church. We'll get into that in verse 19. They will divide the faithful from the unfaithful. The wheat and the weeds are not just out there in the world. The wheat and the weeds sit in church I don't think any weeds are here as I know you are. Maybe you've deceived me all these years. You know whether that word of the Lord fills you with joy and fills you with peace and fills you with the knowledge that you and God dwell together. And he talks about the apostles. That's where the church always goes. All the reforming in the church, and this happens every generation, <coughs> all the reforming in the church is always going back to the original, and that's the apostles. The apostles are anyone who has seen Jesus, taught by Jesus, approved by Jesus, sent out by Jesus, given the authority to write scripture, and given authority over the early church. Every congregation was underneath the authority of the apostles. When those apostles all died off, 
Then if you have studied church history, you've heard something about the apostolic fathers. Have you heard about them? Apostolic fathers, just like all of you young boys back then. Young people don't stay young. They become adults. And what you and I teach the young today is what the church will be tomorrow. The apostolic fathers were these young men whom the apostles taught. Timothy would be an apostolic father. And then that goes on and on and on. Remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ were told. You know what they told? Here's what Paul says to Timothy. But understand this. I'm in Timothy 3, if you're taking notes. Timothy 3, 1 to 5. But understand this, that in the last days, and I want it clear, the last days began when Christ ascended into heaven. We've been in the last days for 2,000 years. When people say, I think we're living in the last days, shake their hand and say, you're right. We've been there for 2,000 years. <laughs> the last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, <coughs> lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, Timothy, have nothing to do with them. Does that describe today? Perfect. That's always been true because God has ordained it. He writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. He says, the people will not endure sound doctrine. They're going to have a class studying doctrine. I don't have time for that. It's too deep. They won't endure sound, firm doctrine. He writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. They devote themselves to deceitful spirits. I go to the next verse, verse 18. They, these apostles, said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. That's God's will. God isn't wringing his hands and trying to say, oh my goodness now, look what they're doing to my church. Every false prophet is carrying out God's will. And God gives some people over to disobedience. Romans chapter 1. The false prophet is God's tool for that. And so when you bump into a false prophet, how are you going to know well, I'm going to give you a couple clues about that at the moment. And that is, when they speak, they are going to use words which we call relative or subjective. Does that make sense to anybody? Let me explain it to you. It's kind of fun sometimes to discuss things. I've been in a lot of discussions, and John, I think you have too where you're talking about, you know, people who firmly believe 
Genesis 1 to 11 is not historical. <laughs> that can't be true. Science has discovered these rocks are billions of years old, and these uh, fossils are billions of years old, and the dinosaurs <laughs> died off not 63 million years ago. And you want to believe the earth is only 6,000 years old? And you believe God created in six 24-hour days? And then you say, well, what are you? What's your view? You know what they say? I think. My opinion. Science says. Got any problem with that? You tell me where you can be true to the scripture and you can say God said that's how my preaching goes I hope I always want you to understand if it comes out of my mouth it's based on the word of God Appreciate it. Thank you. There's a lot of heresy in the church. <coughs> Last year, an organization called the Gospel Coalition, a tremendous group, there's another group called Christianity Today, there's another group called the Pew Research, Pew as in Church Pew, and they did a survey of evangelicals. Now, if you are an evangelical, you confess the Bible is the only source of truth and life. You also say, if you're an evangelical, I believe the gospel must be preached and proclaimed to the unbeliever. Because there is a God and there is a judgment. You also believe that Christ's death has paid the penalty of your sin. And you believe that God and God alone has saved you. You did not help him save yourself. Are you all evangelical? I would be shocked if one of you said, I'm not. I believe that's what you believe. But they did a survey in 2022. What year was that? That was just last year. And they asked this question. Is Genesis 1 to 11 historical? 26% of evangelicals said no. Genesis 1 to 11 is all allegory, it's just a story. If you want to say Genesis 1 to 11 is not historical, then why is Genesis 12 historical? And why are the Ten Commandments historic? God said there are going to be teachers and they're going to lead many astray. Another question. 90% uh, by the way of all evangelicals say God is perfect. They believe God is in three persons. They believe in the physical resurrection of Christ. They believe my good works do not help save me. 
Then they're asked this question. Does God accept the faith of Muslims, of Jews, <coughs> of Buddhists, of Hindus? What do you think? I'm talking evangelicals. Fifty-six percent, over half of evangelicals says God would save a good Muslim, a good Hindu, a good Buddhist. I've met some of them. They're just wonderful people. And so they, they're asked the next question, well, is Jesus the only way to God? And they say, 56% say no. There are other ways to God. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You see what's happening? You ask him another question. Did God create Jesus? And 73% of evangelicals last year said yes. When you create something, you make something that is of a different essence than yourself. If you make a birdhouse, I can't use the word create because you have to have some boards and some screws, but if you make a birdhouse, it's of a different essence than yourself. It might have a little bit of your blood on it or something. When you say God created Jesus, look, when God creates in Genesis chapter 1, everything God created was of a different essence than God himself. And so to say, Jesus is created by God, you're saying Jesus is not God. Now why do they say that? There are many more and I'm not going to bore you with it. This is the evidence that contending for the faith is really weak. When evangelicals cannot answer basic questions. I don't blame the student. The student is not greater than the teacher. It's a reflection on the failure. And I'm going to add these words. That God has ordained to deceive those who are not his sheep. Jesus Christ <coughs> was given everyone that God has chosen. That's you. And there is no one can snatch him out of, you know, can, can, can snatch you out of his hand. When you hear false teaching, you smell a rat. I hope. And so we get into to verse 18. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts, and do not have the Spirit. 
the only way this congregation is going to stay united is that we all start at the same point and we start at the Word of God. Amen. You want to start any place else, we will not walk with you. We can. That's the problem in this country. We're no longer starting on a moral law of God. We're starting on a humanistic <laughs> my experience, my desires, my thoughts, and everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. But you, my people, when you are being taught, and you're being taught now, number one, is everything that I'm saying, does it have its origin in God? It's the first question you ask. And somebody says, Genesis 1 to 11 is not historical. Can you find that in the scripture? Jesus quotes it. Second, where does its authority come from? Well, if you start from the Word of God, the authority is right there. But if you want to start with science, what is the authority of a science proposal? And you can say, well, we've got that Mars rover going. We've got pictures of Jupiter. And Junior can have open heart surgery one Monday and come home the next. That's wonderful science. It's God's gift. But when you get into historical science, about billions of years and millions of years and Dinosaurs living 63 million years ago, and here we have carvings of them that are only a thousand years old. Historical science is no science at all. It can't be repeated, it can't be examined, it can't be tested. Anybody here want to try to repeat the Big Bang? <laughs> It's man's attempt to get rid of God. Another thing, consistency, is what is being taught, is that taught throughout Scripture. At the mouth of two or three witnesses. That's why I want to quote more than one text. New Testament, Old Testament. Number four, does this teaching make you grow spiritually? Does it build you up in the word of the Lord? And finally, does this teaching promote godly living in my life? If all of those are true, you're listening to a prophet, to a teacher who's teaching you the truth. The church today, not this one, but there are churches today that have gone completely 
away from the moral law of God, confirming lifestyles that are in direct opposition to God. And they bless these marriages. And they celebrate. Because God, Jesus says, there will be false prophets. They are there to deceive. Those who are not my sheep. That doesn't mean we never sin. It means I know the truth when I hear it. And I love it. And I long for it. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts. Well, this is how God made me. I have to live the way I am. And you just better celebrate it with me. Love you, Mom. Love you, Dad. But this is me. And there's nothing wrong with me. You just have to change. You just have to see more clearly. Natural instinct. They do not have the Spirit. I'm going to say amen there. And we will pick it up next week and hopefully finish the book of June next week. Thank you for the bless the preaching. Our Father, it is only because you have chosen us before the creation of the world to be made holy and righteous that you keep us in the truth. May we contend for the faith with one another and with our children and all of those whom you bring into our life. In Jesus' name, amen.